Alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us the tawfiq to meet again and discuss one of the most important surahs of the Holy Quran. Surah at Tawbah, as many of you know, is a surah that has a very unique feature in that it's the only surah in the Holy Quran where the basmala has been omitted. And this surprised many of the early Muslims to such an extent that Amir al-Mu'mineen was asked about this. You see, when the Muslims would recite the Qur'an, they noticed that this surah does not begin with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. And it prompted many of them to ask the Imam as to why the basmala has been omitted when this is the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins every other surah. To which Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam, he says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim lil amani wal rahma That Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim is intended to convey security and mercy. And Surah At-Tawbah has been revealed as a declaration of war against the mushrikeen who had breached the treaty they had made with the Holy Prophet. So the Imam alayhi salam says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim lil amani wal rahma wa nazalat bara'a. This surah was revealed li raf al aman to remove security and immunity from the disbelievers who had breached the treaty with the Holy Prophet and essentially committed treason against the Islamic State. Now, as I mentioned last week, for those who didn't get a chance to listen to the previous lecture, this surah is of great historical significance because it gives us a glimpse into what was happening in the Prophet's last days in the city of Medina. It speaks about the munafiqeen. It speaks about some of the political problems the Holy Prophet was facing in his last days. Now, in ayah number three, we touched upon this last week, but just for the sake of, you know, making today's discussion coherent and understandable, in ayah number three, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَأَذَانٌ مِّنَ اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ إِلَى النَّاسِ يَوْمَ الْحَجِّ الْأَكْبَرِ That's and an announcement. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the first verse made a declaration that he is repudiating the idolaters who had breached the treaty with the Holy Prophet. And now there is a need for a formal announcement. And an announcement from God and his messenger to the people on the day of the greater Hajj. And we mentioned that this day was in the ninth year after the Hijrah, on the 10th of the Hijjah, Yawm al-Nahar, whereby the announcement is that, that Allah and His Messenger repudiated the idolaters. Now, all of the Mufassireen among the Shia commentators, the Sunni commentators, it's mentioned in even the books of Ahadith that the Holy Prophet summoned Abu Bakr. The Prophet is in Medina. And this is a year after the conquest of Mecca. He summons Abu Bakr to deliver this announcement that immunity has been removed from the idolaters who had breached the contract, the, the treaty with the Holy Prophet. They have four months to go back and prepare for war, among other things. So he summons Abu Bakr. Now you may ask, why did the Holy Prophet summon Abu Bakr out of all of the companions? It, should this be considered an honor that he's that he he begins by sending Abu Bakr? Because we know that after the Holy Prophet 
gives this message to Abu Bakr to go to Mecca. He travels about half of the distance to Mecca and then Jibreel appears to the Holy Prophet telling the Prophet that Ya Rasulullah la yu'addiha illa ant aw rajulun mink that Ya Rasulullah no one can make this announcement except you or someone from you because Allah in the Quran he says wa adhanun min Allahi wa rasulih in ayah number three it says that this is an announcement from God and his messenger and therefore the one who is to make this announcement in Mecca has to either be the prophet or someone who is of the same spiritual caliber as the Holy Prophet. So the Prophet, he sends Abu Bakr and then he calls him back. He sends Amir al-Mu'mineen to take this message from Abu Bakr and to go and deliver the message. Because Ali ibn Abi Talib, when he delivers a message, it's as though the Holy Prophet has delivered it. Because he is of a very close spiritual caliber to the Holy Prophet. Now, why did the Holy Prophet send Abu Bakr before sending Ali ibn Abi Talib? Now, it could be, there is no scholar that has explicitly discussed this issue, but it could be that the Prophet knew that the Mushrikeen would not attack Abu Bakr because the because Abu Bakr in the early history of Islam did not really establish a track record of fighting against the mushrikeen in battle he did not kill a single mushrik in battle he did not injure a single mushrik in battle so the mushrikeen of Mecca really did not have any animosity towards Abu Bakr. You know, in many cases, you know, they, they felt safe from him. So this is perhaps the rationale behind why the Holy Prophet sent him, because he's not someone that would provoke the Mushrikeen. He did not kill anyone in battle, did not injure anyone. And the Mushrikeen saw him as someone who was docile, that he was not a threat to them. In any case, the Holy Prophet sends Amir al muminin and the Imam alayhi salam goes and makes this call. You know, it's interesting that we have a hadith from Imam Amir al muminin where he speaks about his merits. And he says, That I am the announcer in dunya and in the akhirah. So in dunya, Imam Amir al muminin is the Mu'addin because of this ayah. He goes to Mecca and he delivers this message on behalf of the Holy Prophet because he's the nafs of the Prophet. So when Allah says, وَأَذَانٌ مِّنَ اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ إِلَى النَّاسِ يَوْمِ الْحَجِّ الْأَكْبَرِ It was Ali ibn Abi Talib who makes this announcement. And because he is of, the, of a similar spiritual caliber to the Holy Prophet, when he announces to the mushrikeen, it's as though the Prophet has made the announcement. So this is the Imam's announcement in dunya. What does Ali ibn Abi Talib mean when he says that I am the announcer in dunya and in akhirah? In Surah Al-A'raf, verse number 44, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَنَادَى أَصْحَابُ الْجَنَّةِ أَصْحَابَ النَّارِ The people of paradise will call upon the inmates of the hellfire, saying to them, أَنْ قَدْ وَجَدْنَا مَا وَعَدَنَا رَبُّنَا حَقَّ We have found that the promise of our Lord is true. Allah has promised us reward. He's promised to honor the righteous, and he has fulfilled his promise. فَهَلْ وَجَدْتُمْ أَهْلُ الْجَنَّةِ They ask the people of the hellfire. فَهَلْ وَجَدْتُمْ 
ma wa'ada rabbukum haqqa did you also find the promise of your lord to be true qalu na'am the people of the hellfire will say yes and then the ayah says fa'adhana mu'adhinun baynahum al la'natullahi 'ala adh-dhalimin a caller will call out from between them because the quran mentions that there are people on the araf on these on these hills between the hellfire and jahannam so there will be a mu'adhin who will call out on the day of judgment that the that the oppressors are removed from the mercy of allah so the mufassirin also say that this is ali ibn abi talib so in dunya, he's the mu'adhin who delivers the message of bara'a to the mushrikeen of Mecca. And on the day of judgment, he is the caller who sends la'na upon, he makes that statement that the oppressors, the wicked, are deprived of divine mercy. So Allah says, وَأَذَانٌ مِّنَ اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ إِلَى النَّاسِ يَوْمَ الْحَجِّ الْأَكْبَرِ so Imam Amir al muminin he goes to Mecca and he delivers this message. Now what, is, what does the Imam say when he gets to, to Mecca? So you have a number of tribes who had violated, who had breached the treaty that they had made with the Prophet. Some of them were giving weapons to the enemies of the Prophet. They were building alliances with the enemies of the Holy Prophet. Amir al muminin he goes to Mecca and he says, number one, لا يطوفن بالبيت عريان That from now on, no one is allowed to make tawaf around the Kaaba naked. Now this may sound shocking and obscene but this was a custom in the days of jahiliya that some people would perform tawaf around the kaaba naked and this is what happened when the holy prophet conquered mecca the prophet saw some of the mushrikeen doing this and therefore that year and the following year he doesn't perform hajj as a statement because of the obscenity because of the obscenities that he witnessed so the first thing that Amir al-Mu'mineen mentions in his message of Bara'a is that there is a ban now on anyone who wants to perform tawaf nude. It's not allowed anymore. Number two, وَلَا يَحُجَّنَّ الْبَيْتَ مُشْرِكُونَ That mushrikeen are no longer allowed to perform hajj. They're not allowed to enter the haram. Number three, the Imam says, وَمَنْ كَانَ لَهُ مُدَّةٌ فَهُوَ إِلَىٰ مُدَّةٍ Whoever has a treaty with the Prophet and they have not violated that treaty and their, their duration of that agreement is more than four months because as we mentioned, when the treaties were breached, Rasulullah grants four months to these mushrikeen to go back home and to prepare for war. If there are some mushrikeen who have a treaty with the Prophet that is more than four months and they have not violated their agreement with the Prophet, the Prophet is going to honor this treaty with them for the duration that they agreed upon. And then the Imam alayhi salam, he says, number four, وَمَنْ لَمْ تَكُنْ لَهُ مُدَّةٌ فَمُدَّتُهُ أَرْبَعَةَ أَشْهُرٌ If the Prophet did not initiate a treaty or any type of agreement with you, then you have four months. If you're mushrik, you have four months to prepare yourself for war. Meaning, the Prophet is not allowing anyone to take a neutral position because for many many years the muslims were being persecuted they were fighting defensive wars so either 
you have to align yourself with the Muslims or you have to enter into war. So Allah says, وَأَذَانٌ مِّنَ اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ إِلَى النَّاسِ يَوْمَ الْحَجِّ الْأَكْبَرِ أَنَّ اللَّهَ بَرِيءٌ مِّنَ الْمُشْرِكِينَ وَرَسُولُهُ فَإِن تُبْتُمْ فَهُوَ خَيْرٌ لَكُمْ So if you repent, it would be better for you. You find that the door of repentance is always open. Even in times of war, you see that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi always leaves the door of peace open. That if you want to repent, if you wish to renounce your actions, your previous actions and your previous alliances, if you want to make amends, that door is open. That opportunity is always available. So if you repent, it would be better for you. It would be better for your dunya and your akhirah. وَإِن تَوَلَّيْتُمْ But if you turn away, and you refuse to repent, and you wish to move forward with your campaign against the messenger, know that you cannot weaken God, you cannot thwart God. It's interesting that when you look at this ayah, Allah is telling the mushrikeen that you were treacherous, you breached your agreement with the Prophet, if you, and you formed alliances with his enemies, you supplied his enemies with weapons, but know that you cannot weaken God. This, uh, this part of the ayah is essentially highlighting the meaning of being Khalifatullah. That these are people who are attacking the Prophet. They're forming a military campaign against the Prophet. They're trying to weaken the Prophet. They're trying to diminish his power and his strength. But here Allah says you cannot weaken God. Because when you try to attack the Prophet, you're trying to attack God himself. So you see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala equates attacking the Prophet and committing treason against the Prophet to weaken the Prophet. He's likening it, likening it to weakening himself, that you cannot weaken God. Because everything the Holy Prophet does represents Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is why if you go to Surah Al-Ahzab, Verse 57, Surah 33, verse 57, Allah mentions something similar to this. Where when the Prophet is being attacked, he speaks about the attack being launched against himself. Allah says, Allah wa rasula, Those who hurt God and His Messenger. Those who hurt God and His Messenger. Now Allah is all-powerful. Allah cannot be hurt. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cannot be weakened. So why does Allah say those who hurt God and His Messenger? The idea that the ayah is trying to convey is that when you hurt my Messenger, I take it personally. This is what Allah is saying. When the ayah says, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يُؤْذُونَ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَ Those who hurt God and His Messenger. Allah is saying that when you hurt my Prophet, I take it personally. Similarly, when you breach agreements with the Prophet, when you violate the terms of a treaty in an attempt to weaken my Messenger, you cannot weaken him in the same way that you cannot weaken God because he is the representative of God on earth. Know that you cannot weaken God. And give the disbelievers glad tidings of a painful punishment. A painful punishment in this life and the hereafter. 
that the humiliation will happen in dunya even before the akhirah. Now, in ayah number four, there's an exception. So the mushrikeen, many of them, they breach their contract with the Prophet. They violate the terms of the treaty they had with him. And the Prophet now is basically announcing that there's no more immunity. That now it's a declaration of war. Is Rasulullah at war with all of the mushrikeen? The ayah here says no. The ones who still have immunity, the ones whom we are still on good terms with, are those idolaters, except those idolaters with whom you have made a treaty and who thereafter commit no breach against you. لم ينقصوكم شيئا ولم يظاهروا عليكم أحدا nor did they support anyone against you now some of the mushrikeen who violated the contract with the prophet now maybe they did not commit any act of hostility directly but they were supporting the prophet's enemies so Allah says the idolaters who did not breach the agreement with you nor did they support anyone against you. Fulfill the treaty with them for its duration. Ya Rasulullah, if you made a treaty with a the idolaters, a tribe among them, for one year, five years, ten years, you have to honor that. Inna Allah yuhibbul muttaqeen. Now, this is important, brothers and sisters. It's easy to honor the terms of agreement when you're not in a position of power. You see, brothers and sisters, Rasulullah is now in the ninth year after the Hijrah. He has conquered Mecca. He has an army. He has an incredible amount of wealth at his disposal. He has a government. He has a military. He's in a position of power. The mushrikeen are in a position of weakness. Yet, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the Prophet that you have to still honor the treaties with the mushrikeen. You know, today in the world, we see, you know, if you take a, 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 a contemporary example, when the United States decided to walk away from the Iran deal, you know, they, they breached their contract. Why? Because they see themselves as being in a position of power. So they feel no need to honor these agreements. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi is in a position of power. He has the ability to obliterate them. But Allah says, oaths and treaties are sacred. Even if this treaty is with a weaker entity, you have to honor it. Even if they're mushrikeen, these are people that fought you, you know, in the early days of Islam. These are the same people that drove you out. They don't have necessarily a good track record with you. But you still have to honor this agreement. If you look at the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Ali Imran, it's a very interesting verse. And it's it's the attitude that many Muslims today unfortunately have. In Surah Ali Imran, verse 75, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks to us about the Ahl al Kitab. You see, brothers and sisters, the Bani Israel, especially during the time of the Prophet, they had this belief that contracts contractual obligations with Gentiles, with non-Jews, were different. They didn't have the same weight. And therefore, they did not feel the need to observe those treaties with the same care. So the Jews, if they entered into a contract with another Jew, they felt that they had to honor that contract. But if 
they initiated an agreement with Gentiles, they did not observe the same degree of care. And Allah mentions this in the Quran. In ayah number 75, Allah says, وَمِنْ أَهْلِ الْكِتَابِ مَنْ إِنْ تَأْمَنْهُ بِقِنْطَارٍ يُؤَدِّهِ إِلَيْكِ Allah tells the Prophet that from among the Ahlul Kitab, the Jews and the Christians, there are some among them whom if you entrust them with a heap of wealth, a huge amount of wealth, they will return that trust to you. So Allah reminds the Prophet and the Muslim community that there are very trustworthy people among the Jews and the Christians. You can entrust a great deal of wealth, heaps of wealth, to them, and they will return the amana to you. Women whom, but also from among them are those women whom men in men who be dinar and la you eddi ilayka illa ma dum ta'ale illa ma dum ta'ale hi qa'ima. And there are some among them, especially the Jews during the time of the Prophet. If you were to try to entrust them with a with one gold coin, they would not return that trust to you unless you're on top of them you're on, consistently demanding it from them why did they have this attitude allah says ذلك, ذلك that these ummiin these mushrikeen these gentiles these non-jews you know we have no we have nothing to do with them meaning that they don't have the same value in our eyes and there are Muslims who are like this today you know they cheat their governments they break their promises why oh because they're non-muslims they're mushrikeen they're kuffar Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not allow his messenger to breach treaties with mushrikeen Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala condemns the Jews of Ahlul Kitab for having this attitude that Gentiles deserve lesser treatment when it comes to fulfilling contractual obligations. So this idea of honoring, fulfilling oaths, honoring treaties is something very sacred in the Islamic tradition. In fact, there's a beautiful hadith from Imam Jafar al-Sadiq alayhi salatu was salam where he says, Addul amana if you have an agreement with someone, if someone entrusts you with something, you have to protect it, you have to return that trust, even if it is with the killer of Imam al Hussein. Imam al Sadiq says, even if you make an agreement with Shim, you have to honor it. You don't have, there is no. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't allow us to make any concessions when it comes to this issue. When Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib wrote a letter when he appointed Malik al ashtar as the, the governor of Egypt, one of the things that the Imam says to him in the letter, he says to Malik, لَيْسَ مِنَ مِنْ فَرَائِضِ اللَّهِ شَيْءٌ الناس أشد عليه اجتماعا مع تفرق أهوائهم وتشتت آرائهم من تعظيم الوفاء بالعهد. The Imam says there is not there is not a single one of the obligations that Allah has placed on us that the people are united, they are in agreement about, despite the fact that people have different opinions about many issues. People have different opinions about salah, about fasting, about hajj. But people, despite their different backgrounds and their different creeds and their different ideologies, people generally are in agreement that you should fulfill your oath. That you, when you make a promise, you should fulfill that promise. You shouldn't violate or breach a contract that you make. Atheist, believer, Arab, non-Arab, black, white, male, female, people generally agree that if you make a promise, you have to fulfill that promise. If you have a treaty, 
You should not violate the terms of that treaty. This is what the Imam السلام, says to Malik, reminding him that when you promise your subject something, if you have a social contract with them, you have to honor it. Don't think that you can walk away from your words because you're in a position of power. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not even give this concession to his prophet. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ends ayah number four by saying, Inna Allah yuhibbul muttaqeen. Allah loves those who have taqwa. You see, brothers and sisters, there are many verses in the Quran that associate taqwa not just with religious rituals. You know, when we think of the muttaqeen, we think of people who recite Quran, who pray, who fast, who go to Hajj, who make ziyara. But there are many verses in the Quran that speak about taqwa in the context of human relations. Who are the people of taqwa? They're the people that honor their oaths, even if the oath is made with mushrikeen. This, this is taqwa. This is one of the dimensions of taqwa that oftentimes we may overlook. And then we go to ayah number five. And ayah number five is probably the favorite verse in the Quran, you know, in the eyes of the Islamophobes today. If you open up, if you listen to Fox News, anyone who wants to, you know, paint Islam as a religion of violence, as a religion of terror, as a religion of brutality, as a death cult, you know, Surah at tawbah ayah number five, is typically the verse that they use to substantiate that claim. So what is ayah number five saying? فَإِذَا سَلَخَ الْأَشْهُرُ الْحُرُمُ فَاقْتُلُوا الْمُشْرِكِينَ حَيْثُ وَجَدْتُمُوهُمْ وَخُذُوهُمْ وَحْصُرُوهُمْ وَقْعُدُوا لَهُمْ كُلَّ مَرْصَدٍ فَإِنْ تَابُوا وَأَقَامُوا الصَّلَاةِ وَآتُوا الزَّكَاةِ فَخَلُّوا سَبِيلَهُمْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ غَفُورٌ رَحِيمٌ Allah says, then when the sacred months have passed, we mentioned that Allah gave the mushrikeen who breached their treaties with the Prophet four months. The announcement is made in Mecca. Four months are given to the people to go back to their homes and to prepare for war. When these sacred months, Allah calls them sacred because he does not allow the Muslims to engage in any, in any, any military conflict. Everyone is safe. Peace for four months. When the sacred months have passed, Kill the idolaters wherever you find them. Capture them. Besiege them. And lie in wait for them at every place of ambush. But if they repent and perform the prayer and give the alms, then let them go their way. Surely God is oft forgiving and most merciful. Now, this verse is typically taken out of context. You know, when, when people want to portray Islam as a religion of violence and terror, they say, look, the Quran clearly says you have to kill the non-believers wherever you find them. Capture them, besiege them, lie in wait, ambush them. But who is the prophet? What who are these people? What what group of people is this ayah talking about? This verse is speaking about a very specific category of idolaters. These are individuals who have been persecuting Muslims for over a decade, war after war. They were persecuting the Muslims when they were in Mecca. When the Muslims left Mecca to establish their own state in Medina. The Meccans were chasing after them. They fought them in battle after battle after battle. Rasulullah now is in a position of power. He conquers Mecca. He grants them general amnesty. He, he 
enters into different treaties with them. They break, they breach their treaties with the Prophet. They continue to support the Prophet's enemies and equip them with weapons. Allah says, enough is enough. These individuals have to be killed because if they are not killed, if they are not captured, they will continue to form alliances to completely obliterate the Muslim community. So from the perspective of the Muslim community, the years of conflict preceding the announcement made in Mecca created a political environment where the idolaters could not be left in a position of power and political strength to menace the Muslim community in the future. Because these individuals, brothers and sisters, it's not that they're just mushrikeen and they're just living their lives. These are mushrikeen who are militant. They have an agenda to fight the Prophet, even though they've entered into peace agreements, they've breached them. The Prophet has caught them committing, committing treason. The Prophet has given them a four month period to repent, to renounce their actions. If they refuse to renounce their actions, if they refuse to renounce their alliances with the Prophet's enemies, Allah says, you have to kill them. It's war. It's a declaration of war. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, kill, Allah doesn't say kill all of them. You see, there are different things that are mentioned in the verse. Allah says, kill them wherever you find them. Capture them. Sometimes you don't need to kill them. Capturing them is, the, is sufficient. Sometimes you don't need to capture them. You just besiege them. So there are different things that are mentioned in the verse. And the Muslims and the Prophet, they have to use their judgment. Are these individuals so dangerous that we have to kill them? Or can we just capture them and hold them as prisoners? The ayah mentions different tactics that can be used to deal with these combative and these dangerous enemies. But you notice that ayah number five, when people cite it, they usually just mention the first part of the verse. They mention the first part. They don't mention the part that says, فَإِنْتَابُ That if you repent and establish prayer and pay alms, then you're free. See, this is the difference between the wars during the time of the Prophet and during the time of Jahiliyyah. During the time of Jahiliyyah, there's no opportunity given to the enemies to repent or renounce their actions or to make an attempt at peace. Here, even in times of war, that door is still open, the door of repentance, the door of renunciation, that you renounce your previous actions and your previous alliances. The ayah says if they repent and they establish prayer and pay alms. Why does the Quran mention وَأَقَامُ in addition to repenting وَأَقَامُ الصَّلَاةُ وَآتُ الزَّكَاةُ it's because in, time, in times of war, if someone wants to become Muslim, the Muslim community may be suspicious of that person, that maybe they're submitting simply because, you know, they're afraid, that it's not a true submission to Islam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says if they repent and they pray and they're giving charity, meaning, you know, the Prophet every year he would send tax collectors, if they're paying their tax, to the government and they're praying, you have no reason to question their Islam. That this is an indication that perhaps their faith is sincere and you should not harbor any skepticism towards them. You should not be suspicious of them. In ayah number 13, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the rationale, the underlying rationale behind why he's treating these mushrikeen in a very severe way in ayah number five. In ayah number 13 of Surah At-Tawbah, and we'll get to this inshallah, maybe in our next session. Why does why is Allah so harsh with them? In ayah number 13, Allah gives us the rationale. 
He says, Ala tuqatiluna qawman nakathu aymanuhum. Will you not fight a group of people who have breached their oaths, their treaties with you? Wahammu bi ikhrajur rasul. And they have made so many attempts to expel the messenger. And they are the ones who have always initiated the hostility. So it's not that these mushrikeen are being fought only because they're mushrikeen. The Prophet is not fighting these people just because they don't, they're not Muslim. He's fighting them because they are hostile mushrikeen. They are mushrikeen that when the Muslims were vulnerable in Mecca, they were persecuting the Muslims. When the Muslims established their own government in Medina, they chased after the Muslims. They went to war with the Muslims. Not once, not twice, not three times, many different occasions. When the Prophet was in a position of power and he granted them, them amnesty and he entered into these peace treaties, they continued to plot against the Prophet. So these people cannot be left alone because they will continue to form a persistent political alliance against the Prophet because their goal, their objective is to destroy Islam. It's to destroy the Muslim community. You can't leave them. They're like a dormant cancer. You can't leave them. So this is why, so in reality, ayah number five is an act of defense against an enemy that refuses to coexist with the Muslims. This is the point that we have to understand. Islam has no problem in coexisting with members of other faith traditions. But Islam understands that there are certain people that are so hostile that refuse to coexist with the Muslims. And the only way that you can deal with them is war. There's no other option. Because they refuse the path of diplomacy and peace. So Allah says, kill them wherever you find them. And capture them. Be very harsh in dealing with them. Because their agenda is to plot against you. And then in ayah number six. Ayah number six is really an amazing verse. وَإِنْ أَحَدٌ مِنَ الْمُشْرِكِينَ اسْتَجَارَكَ فَأَجِرُ حَتَّى يَسْمَعَ كَلَامَ اللَّهِ ثُمَّ أَبْلِغْهُ مَأْمَنَ ذَلِكَ بِأَنَّهُمْ قَوْمٌ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ And if any of the idolaters seek asylum with you, grant him asylum until he hears the word of God, then send him to his place of safety. This is because they are a people who do not know. So ayah number five is an indication, the one, the ayah that I mentioned before, after the four months, now it's war. It's war between the Muslims and the mushrikeen who refuse to coexist with the Muslims, who continue to form alliances against the Prophet. Even during the time of war, this ayah is saying that if the mushrikeen, if one mushrik or if a tribe wants immunity so they can enter into the Muslim territories to listen to the Quran, you have to grant them immunity. So imagine it's wartime. A mushrik wants to enter Medina. He wants to enter Muslim territory. Allah says to the Prophet that if they seek asylum, grant them asylum. Even though they were combative enemies, if they wish to seek asylum in order to listen to the Quran, grant them asylum. And if any Muslim attacks that mushrik, who was granted asylum, the Muslim is to be punished. If that mushrik comes to Muslim territory and listens to the word of Allah, listens to the Quran, 
and they're still not convinced that this is the word of God, what do you have to do? The ayah says, You have to send him back to a place of safety. Meaning that even, even though he's in Muslim territory, he has listened to the Quran, he has rejected the Quran, you cannot do anything to him because you've granted him immunity. You have to send him back to his place of safety. And if he wishes to continue fighting against you, that's his decision. Now, you see, brothers and sisters, this ayah really sets the standard for taqwa when it comes to human relations. That even in time of war, if a mushrik wants to come to Muslim lands and listen to the Quran, you have to grant him any immunity. And even after he listens to it and he decides he wants to reject, you have to send him back safely. You have to protect him until he gets to his home. And if he wishes to fight against you, continue fighting, he's granted that, that, uh, that ability. So number one, what we learn from this ayah is even, in, even during times of war, the effort to guide people should never stop. Ayah number five, is a declaration of war. But even during war, there should be a system of guidance that is available. That the effort to guide the mushrikeen should still be there. It should not stop. Number two, those who wish to hear the word of Allah should be granted protection. So it's not that a mushrik comes and, you know, He's on his own. That the Prophet, the Muslims have a responsibility of protecting the mushrik who wishes to listen to the Quran. He hasn't converted. He just wants to listen. He wants to judge whether this book is the word of God or not. He has to be granted protection. Number three, what we learn from this ayah is the mushrik who is granted asylum to listen to the word of Allah has the freedom to accept or reject. He should not be coerced to accept. He has the freedom. Number four, after rejecting the Quran, the Muslims are obligated to protect him and deliver him and escort him to his place of safety. So even if he lives far away the muslims have to spend money on protecting and ensuring this mushrik is delivered safely to his home and then after that if he wishes to continue fighting against the the muslims he's free to do that number five what we learn from this ayah is many disbelievers who reject Islam, do it out of ignorance, not because they're evil. Because what does Allah say? Some of us, some Muslims have this impression that if someone is not Muslim, it means that they're evil. There's a disease in their hearts. Allah says, no, many of them are ignorant. Many of these mushrikeen, it's not that they're evil, they're just ignorant. Ask me, why does the mushrik have to seek asylum and come to Muslim territory in Medina to listen to the Quran? Why doesn't, why don't they go and meet with some of the tribes that are li living on the boundaries of the Islamic lands? Why is it that the mushrik has to come to Medina to listen to the Quran? Why do they have to come to the Prophet to listen to Kalamullah? Because the verse says that grant them asylum so they can listen to the word of God. Why does the mushrik have to come to the Prophet? And this is another lesson that we learned from the ayah. It's because Allah wants to ensure that the message is conveyed properly and accurately to this mushrik. An average Muslim 
teaching this mushrik Islam is not like Rasulullah teaching in Islam. So when the mushrik, when the non-believer wants to learn Islam, Allah has set up a system where he comes to Muslim territory, is granted asylum and protection, and is, is allowed to meet the Prophet. And the Prophet teaches them the Qur'an. And even if they reject the Qur'an, when it is taught to them by the Prophet, now for sure if Rasulullah is inviting someone to Islam and they still reject, that means that there's a disease in their heart. That's clear. That means that there's something wrong. But even then, even if someone is has a diseased heart who rejects the Islam that is taught to them by Rasulullah, you still have to take them to a place of safety. You still have to ensure that they arrive at a place of safety. And if they want to continue fighting against the Muslims, they are free to do so. So really, brothers and sisters, the takeaway message from this ayah, from ayah number five and ayah number six, is that even during times of war, Islam is still interested in guiding people. Islam is not interested in expanding territory. Islam is interested in expanding minds and hearts, even during time of war. And even during time of war, Allah doesn't want the mushrikeen to be taught Islam by just anyone. Allah wants them to get the best Islamic education from the Prophet himself. And even if they reject, do not harm them. Do not abuse them. They still have immunity, escort them back to a place of safety. And if they wish to continue fighting against the Prophet and the Muslims, they have that freedom. But again, ayah number five, which is always used as a verse to attack Islam as a religion of violence, this is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala having a zero tolerance policy with those disbelievers who refuse to coexist with Muslims. This is why they're fought. Because they don't want peace. They don't want diplomacy. They have an agenda to fight the Prophet, to rally people against the Prophet, to arm the Prophet's enemies. And this is why I number five has a very harsh tone because it's dealing with people who refuse to create an atmosphere of peaceful coexistence. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless us and guide us and illuminate our hearts with the teachings of Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad.